In the previous two lectures, we've been talking about translational symmetry. This is the symmetry associated with a lattice. In this lecture, we're going to talk about point symmetry, which is the symmetry associated with an isolated object. Everyone in here who is an inorganic chemist or has taken upper level chemistry is probably familiar with these point symmetry elements and their corresponding operations that I show here. We can have an identity, uh, which doesn't do anything to an object, uh, but it's a necessary mathematical inclusion, uh, in, as we'll see when we get to point groups. We could have an inversion center, that is, we invert through a point. So if we have an atom that has coordinates x, y, z, uh, and the inversion center is at the origin, afterwards, the new coordinates would be minus x, minus y, minus z. We can have a mirror plane. And the operation associated with the mirror plane would be, as the name implies, a reflection through the plane. And then we can have a proper rotation axis. So if we were to have something like a threefold rotation axis, that means we're going to rotate by 360 divided by n about an axis. And for a threefold rotation axis, n would be 3, so the rotation would be 120. And it means after doing that operation three times, we'll be back to where we started. If we have a six-fold rotation axis, we would rotate by 60. And in that case, we have to go around six times before we get back to where we started. And then we have a roto-inversion axis, n bar. And so this is kind of a composite symmetry element, which contains, first of all, a rotation axis that we just discussed, followed by an inversion operation. Now, those of you who've studied point group symmetry for molecules, in that treatment, one normally talks about a roto-reflection axis. That is, we rotate by a certain amount, and then we reflect through a mirror plane that is perpendicular to the axis. In crystallographic symmetry, we don't use that symmetry element. Instead, we're going to use this roto-inversion axis. So if we have a four-bar axis, that is a four-fold roto-inversion axis, we would rotate by 90 degrees and then do an inversion. Okay, so these are all of the symmetry elements we need for an isolated object. Sometimes these are called all rotational symmetry elements because of the following reason. If we were to rotate by 360 degrees, that is a one proper rotation axis, well then that would be the same as the identity. If we were to rotate by 360 degrees followed by an inversion, that would be a one bar roto inversion axis, that would be the same as simply an inversion center. And finally, if we were to rotate by 180 degrees, followed by an inversion, that would be a two-bar roto-inversion axis, that would be the same thing as a mirror plane. So we can even describe the first three elements here as either proper rotation axes or roto-inversion axes. Now in crystals, we're going to have two additional symmetry elements that are a composite of one of these rotations or mirrors followed by a translation. And these two new composite symmetry elements, which you don't have for isolated molecules, but you do have in crystals, are the glide plane and the screw axis. So let's talk about each of those in turn. So a glide plane is a composite of two operations. First, we're going to reflect through the glide that is, it's going to act as a mirror. And then secondly, we're going to have a translation parallel to the glide plane. So, for example, I can reflect and then translate parallel to the glide plane. It's important to remember that the translation always has to be parallel to the plane. Now, if you think about it for a minute, there are many different vectors that are parallel to that glide plane. And that leads us to different kinds of glide planes. 
Here are some examples. If we were to look up here in the top left, what we see is we're going to reflect through this dashed line, which stands for the glide plane, and then we're going to translate by one-half unit cell in the B direction. That is one-half of the B lattice vector. Okay, so this kind of glide plane, it's called an axial glide because the translation is just half of one of the lattice vectors. And specifically, it's called a B glide because the translation is one half of the B lattice vector. Now, if we take this very same plane and we change the translation, so we reflect, but now we're going to translate by one half of the C lattice vector. Right? That translation is also parallel to the glide plane. And that's going to put our object, that's a function of this symmetry element, at a different place. Right? So in this case, it's going to be coming out of the plane of the board here by one half of the C lattice vector. And we could also have an A glide plane. Now the A glide plane cannot be perpendicular to the A axis, because if it were, the translation of one half unit cell vector in the A direction would not be parallel to the glide plane. So here I've drawn an A glide plane that is perpendicular to the B axis. So you see we're going to reflect and then translate by one half of the A lattice vector. We can also have more complex translations. So we could have this exact same glide plane, but after the reflection, we could translate first by one half A, and then secondly by one half C. So that would raise it out of the plane of the board here. When we have two translations, we call that a diagonal glide, and that's typically given the name N glide. So we can see that the name of the glide plane comes from the type of translation. But all of these translations are always parallel to the plane itself. So we can have axial glides that are either A, B, or C. Uh, and in those, we have a translation by one half of one of the three lattice vectors. We can have diagonal glides, which are given the symbol N, and in those, the translations are one half of two lattice vectors, both parallel to the glide plane. And then we'll see in some higher symmetry centered space groups, like the face centered and the body centered space groups, we can have what's called a diamond glide. And that translation, it's similar to the diagonal glide, but the translation is only one quarter of the two unit cell vectors that are parallel to the glide plane itself. So we have axial glides, diagonal glides, and diamond glides. What about screw axes? Well, a screw axis, the two composite elements of that symmetry operation are, first of all, a rotation by 360 divided by n, where n is the order of the axis. And that's followed then by a translation by a certain fraction of the unit cell vector that is parallel to the screw axis. So let's illustrate with a couple of examples. On the left here, I have a 2 sub 1 screw axis. All right, and so the 2 tells us that the rotation should be by 360 degrees divided by 2 or by 180 degrees. And then the translation is by the subscript divided by the main number, so 1 divided by 2, 1 half of the unit cell vector that is parallel to the screw axis. All right, so here we're going to translate by 1 half C, and we're going to rotate by 180. So we can see that this hurricane-looking thing would end up over here after 1 2 sub 1 screw axis. If we were to apply a second 2 sub 1 screw axis, then we would rotate by another 180 and translate by another 1 half of the C lattice vector. And so that would just take the object back here, which would be the same thing as translating by 1 
C lattice vector. Uh, over on the right, we have a 4 sub 1 screw axis. So here, uh, 360 divided by 4 is 90 degrees. So the rotations are 90 degrees. And because it's a 4 sub 1 screw axis, the translation is by 1 fourth of here, we're going to call it the C lattice vector. So that's one application of the 4 sub 1 screw axis. There's two applications of the 4 sub 1 screw axis. And at this point, I might add that we would have the same thing, actually, as a 2 sub 1 screw axis. And then here's three applications of the 4 sub 1 screw axis. And then finally, four times operating of the 4 sub 1 screw axis gives us the object back translated by one unit of the C lattice vector. All right, so these are screw axes. Those are the symmetry elements. Now, to understand the symmetry of an object, let's say a molecule, we are going to put together different symmetry elements into something called a point group. So a point group is a set of operation, point symmetry elements, that fulfill the mathematical requirements of being a group and then act on an isolated object. And so here are the properties of a group in mathematics. We say that it will have closure. That means the combination of any two elements yields another element of the group. It will obey the associative law. That is, the order of operations doesn't matter. It will have an identity. Uh, so it has to have something that when you apply that operation, nothing changes, right? And so that is the identity operation. And have an inversion. And here we don't mean an inversion center. That's not what this means. It just means that every element has uh, another element of the group that when you combine the two of them, you get the identity element. So what I would like you to do is to think about this. Let's take a two-fold rotation axis and let's have a mirror plane perpendicular to it. And I want you to tell me, is that a valid point group? Just those two symmetry operations. And if not, what other symmetry operations do we need to add to those two operations or elements to get a valid point group? We'll stop talking for a minute here, sit down and see if you can work that out, and then come back. All right, let's go over this. So the way you want to approach this is here I've drawn an arrow to indicate my two-fold rotation axis. And then I've drawn a, a mirror plane perpendicular to it. So let's start by saying to be a group, you have to have the identity. All right, so every point group has the identity operation. So it's not enough to just have a two-fold axis and a mirror plane. We must also add the identity. OK, no problem. Now, is it a valid group if we have a two-fold rotation axis, a perpendicular mirror plane, and the identity? Well, let's find out. If I were to operate by applying the two-fold rotation axis, you can see I generate another one of these little hurricane symbols as shown here. OK. Fair enough. What about if I were to do the mirror plane? Well, if I were to act on this object with the mirror plane, I would generate another little hurricane type symbol up here. OK, now the thing of it is, what if I were to do both? What if I were to rotate by 180 and then apply my mirror? Well, in that case, I would get this representation of the, our hurricane symbol. And the thing is, if we look at this object and this object, these two hurricane symbols, we could generate this one over here at the top right just by applying an inversion center through the very point where the twofold axis goes through the mirror plane. All right, so what that means is the combination of a twofold axis and a mirror plane gives you the same thing as an inversion center. So that means for this to be a proper point group, the inversion center must be 
one of the elements of the point group. So in this point group, we have the identity operation, the twofold rotation axis, the mirror plane, and the inversion center. And those four symmetry elements together make up the point group 2 over m, which in the Schoenflies notation that's used for molecules is called C2 sub h. Now, if we were to map out our object or draw our object, it would look something like this. For any arbitrary representation of our little squiggly thing here, we're going to get three others. And no matter how many times I do a mirror or twofold rotation or an inversion of any of these objects, they just keep mapping back onto each other. All right? So we would say those four symmetry elements together make up the point group 2 over m. In molecules, there are in practice an infinite number of point groups. You know, we can have eightfold rotation axes. We can have tenfold rotation axes. We could, in principle, have a 45-fold rotation axis. But in crystals, we only have a finite number of point groups. And that is because, as I mentioned in the earlier lecture, there are only so many rotation operations that are allowed in crystals. Two-fold rotations, three-fold rotations, four-fold rotations, and six-fold rotations. And so because of that, there are a total of 32 point groups that we find in crystals. These are called the 32 crystallographic point groups. And I've sorted them out here by the crystal system or lattice that they go with. Right? So the point group M3 bar M, if we had that kind of point symmetry in a crystal, it means that our crystal system must be cubic. Our Brave lattice must be cubic. If we have point group 2MM, that means the crystal system must be orthorhombic. All right? And so we see that there is a mapping between the point symmetry of the crystal and the lattice symmetry of the crystal. Now, those of you who've studied the group theory of molecules are probably more familiar with the Schoenflies notation for these point groups. And so here I'm going to list the Schoenflies equivalent of these what are so-called Hermann Mogwin names for the point groups. So M3 bar M, that Hermann Mogwin point group, has exactly the same symmetry elements as the OH of point group in the Schoenflies notation. The point group 2MM is the same thing as the Schoenflies point group C2V. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind.